next session, again, the Patrika Impact Series. The session, New Wealth of Nations, with Arun Mayra, Kiran Majumdar Shah, Surjit S. Bhalla in conversation with John Elliott. Let's welcome our panelists on stage, John Elliott, Kiran Majumdar, Surjit Bhalla, and Arun Mayra. John will be doing the session and he will be introducing the other authors. But I must tell you about John. John Elliott is a formal financial Times journalist. He's been in India for 25 years and he writes a lot for many magazines and writes a blog. That must mean I start, I guess. Um, welcome, everybody, to this session. We're going to explore a whole range of subjects. Um, economics, education, the rise of women, the rise of a new elite, suggestions that wealth inequality, inequality, is declining, and inflation is a thing of the past. Some of those suggestions seem less likely than others, but there we are. We have on the panel, um, the usual, people always say it's a distinguished panel, but this one really is a distinguished panel. Um, moving across, we have Aaron Mara, a former top business executive with Tata and other companies, a top management consultant, once the head of the Boston Consulting Group, and also a former member of the former Planning Commission. We've got Kiran Mazumda Shaw, the founder and head of Biocon. Wait, we've got more. You can clap in a minute. Um, the founder and head of Biocon, India's leading biotech company, and also India's leading woman entrepreneur. Her biotech origins, not everybody knows this, but her biotech origins began with a master's degree in malting and brewing. And in the year 2000, she wrote a book called Ale and Arty the story of beer. I went onto Amazon the other day to see what, if I could get hold of ale and arty, and I discovered that on Amazon.com, that's the American site, it's selling for, wait for it, US dollars 158, and, that, and one of the European Amazon sites, it's selling for Euro 206, 206. I always thought Euros were overvalued. Um, <laughs> Unfortunately, we're not here to discuss Ale and Arty, fun though it would be, and we are here for a very worthy book by Sergit Bala, who is at, at the far end. Sergit is um, a very well-known contrarian economist, contrarian economist and writer, who also dabbles in political forecasting, um, happiest when it's in favor of the current government, and whose latest book is The New Wealth of Nations. There we are, um, for sale. For sale for about, I think, um, probably 600 rupees or something. I'm not quite sure. But certainly not all those dollars. Um, the blurb says, on, on the book, the blurb says, um, I mean, the New Wealth of Nations, the New Wealth of Nations is, of course, a very challenging title. And the blurb says that Bala's thesis is that education is the new wealth and currently of a greater magnitude than financial wealth and much more equally distributed. One of the book's reviewers describes Surjit as a purveyor of uncommon wisdom that provokes you, especially if you're a bleeding heart liberal. And since um, Jaipur Lit Fest is renowned for being full of bleeding heart liberals, um, we're going to have fun. Um, and one of the reviews um, talked about his books as an anticipated event like a new Star Wars installment that they, people wait for, the work of a genuine, un, a, a, a genius, unfettered by politics, or academic niceties. So let's get started. Sergit, how do you think Adam Smith, um, that great um, 18th century Scottish economist and philosopher, would react to his um, title being um, plagiarized, dare I say? No. 
I, I think he'll react very positively. Uh, the whole story, as economists, political scientists, politicians, etc., are concerned with what generates growth. Uh, economists have tussled with this for a long, long time. Adam Smith wrote his book uh, more than 200 years ago, and at that time, there was precious little education around. So his version of what made, and it's a brilliant look, you know, for any economist, Adam Smith is guru number one, guru number two, and guru number three. Um, so I have the deepest respect and admiration for him. It was just that, as we saw in the previous session, he was writing in a very different era. Um, that was an era where women didn't get educated. Um, overall, education was hardly there to talk about. And I just want to remind everybody that it was, now maybe it's the fault of the economists, but it was only until 1960, that's what, 55 years ago, that an economist called Gary Becker recognized and documented that education helped increase one's income. Prior to that, it was resources, it was wealth, it was land, it was feudalism. So basically, we have come a long way, and, and I think we've got a lot further to go, but education is the first amongst equals, and there isn't a second one, uh, there's a third and a fourth one, on determining the fortunes of countries as well as the incomes of individuals, as well as inequality. Okay, you, you, you cover a number of points in the book, as you've already done. Just running through them very quickly, one, the main one is that education is a new wealth, not finance, which has led to a new elite, the, emer the emergence of a new elite, rise in the importance and power of women, world equality being the lowest since 1870, um, developed world may think that after Trump and Brexit that the era of globalization is finished, but it's not for the developing world. Era of inflation over, as I've already said, and your intense dislike of faith in socialists. Um, let's go through those subjects one by one um, and start off with education. Um, Adam Smith, of course, wouldn't have mentioned it because that education wasn't widespread then, so that's scarcely surprising. Hmm. No, I, look... I didn't get the last part. You said Adam Smith, what, sorry? Did not mention ed education, as you've just yes. said. Yes. And it wasn't, it wasn't generally available, so that's not a, I mean. Uh... No, no, so I, at that time, in 1776, education was not an event, was not an occasion. There were hardly any people that were educated. Of course, there were some. Oxford was started, what, a thousand years ago. So I'm not saying that it is, education was not there. It was just not recognized. Remember, I just said that it was not until 1960 the economists were the documenters. Very, I find that very hard to believe. Why not till the 1960s, or why, why not till or why in the 1960s? Look, is this an India thing or is this international? No, no, the, the book is about how the world has changed. And let me answer that very specifically. Look, until 1980, it was 1960 also, as it happens, that Gunnar Myrdal got a Nobel Prize on the Asian drama, and India and Asia was doomed. Was doomed. Why? Okay, if he thought that education would come, and he would be completely wrong, as he was completely wrong, his idea about, and remember, these are Nobel Prize winners, are some of the most brilliant economists, he felt that natural resources, so he had picked out Africa as the great example of what would do well, and Asia as a great example of what would do badly in the game of growth, in the game of fertility, in the game of anything you want to think about. So what happened in the world? Look, since 1980, okay, 1950, and to, just to preempt, education is not the only thing, because after all, China is a fantastic example of growth since 1980. So between 1950 and 1980, they expanded education and didn't get very far. So you need an enabling environment, you need economic freedom, and education is paramount. That is what explains how developing countries have grown much faster. The whole population, Asia, Latin America, Africa, some countries going faster, some countries going slower, but the world has been transformed. It has been transformed in the last 40 years 
because of the spread of education. But mentioning China, you also say that the, the more the education, the more the population gets educated, and the, the, the more the middle class grows, uh, democracy gets stronger. Yes. Well, that, that's one of the little inaccuracies, surely. Look, a lot of these It's a generalization are, that you uh, can't support. A lot, lot of these are, if you will, complicated uh, assertions, and I document, try and document empirically um, how this would be, how this is happening. So, as you know, uh, some of the people who know my writings or from my columns, I look at data, and from the data I derive my conclusions. So all of these things about democracy and how education leads to democracy, etc., have all been empirically documented. But that doesn't mean there's no other explanator. I mean, we should not confuse, you know, um, one explanation and think of exceptions. Oh, I think of an exception and therefore it's not true. It is the dominant influence. I just want to communicate education is the most dominant influence in explaining growth individually, individual incomes, inequality, and the fortunes and misfortunes of nations. But of course, They're dominant. Of course, people don't recognize that because people in this country surely reckon, reckon that land is more important as well than education. And that was true. I mean, families will regard that. And land was true in Adam Smith's time. And that's what I'm saying. That's why this is the new wealth of nations rather than the old wealth of nations. Kieran, um, does education in isolation um, work? Well, I, first and foremost, I must congratulate Surjit for you know, this really uh, fascinating book, which is giving people food for thought. And I couldn't agree more with him, except that I believe that education in isolation will not create wealth. I believe that when we look at countries like India, where we measure, uh, where we don't even distinguish or differentiate between literacy and education, we're constantly looking at you know, people's ability to write, people's ability to read, people's ability to add, and subtract. Look, look at the people who are illiterate, they don't understand what they're reading. And that's what I'm saying. That's why I say that. And 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 that's Research and innovation will create wealth, will create new wealth. And to me, that's a very, very important part of our education policy which is missing. I really believe that in this day and age, where you want to create this new knowledge, where you want to basically you know, get people ready for new jobs, I mean, that itself is another discussion. Because you know, the way we define jobs are very archaic. The jobs of the future are very different. They are knowledge-led. They are about innovation. They are very innovative jobs. But we haven't really got to grips with that. So I really believe you've got to focus on research and innovation. And I just want to say I'm very concerned. A country like India, which should really focus on research and innovation to deliver non-linear growth and to create that new wealth, is only spending 0.69% of its GDP on research. And this is the lowest in the, in the BRIC, amongst the BRIC countries. It is amongst the lowest in the ASEAN countries. You know, uh, Korea spends close to 4% of its GDP. Uh, Brazil spends close to 2%. The US, of course, spends 2.6% and so on and so forth. And if India wants to move the needle, it has to double, if not treble, this investment in research and innovation. And I'm very convinced that it is only a research-driven educational model that will really create what we are talking about, this new wealth of nations. Without that, we will not be able to take advantage of education and knowledge creation. That's my view. As, an, okay? as, as probably India's most well-known and successful um, uh, group, I would, as India's um, probably most successful uh, entrepreneur based on research and innovation, the government must ask you what you think from time to time. What do you tell the government that they should do, that they should do? and more importantly, what, how, does the government re, how do governments over the years, not just the current one, how have the governments over the years responded? Well, you know, we do have various uh, you know, discussions, but I don't see that translating it into 
policy. That's my problem. And what I'm saying is today there's a flawed logic that, you know, wherever, I, I, I really believe that knowledge clusters must be created around centers of excellence. And today we have a very few centers of excellence and these centers of excellence are now being told with very flawed logic that, by the way, you guys have arrived, so we are going to take away those grants that we are giving you, or at least reduce those grants that we are giving you, and we'll give it to these new nascent institutions who really need help. And you guys go and find your you know, money and funding from the private sector. This, to me, is very flawed logic, because the government has a very important role to play in, in you know, investing in education. And That's what we need to do. Governments and state governments saying, hey, we'll set up a knowledge cluster. Sounds so good. It's great publicity. But then very little, very little usually happens. Yeah, so I just think that we really need to understand what are these knowledge clusters. We have a few of them in India, and we should actually try and scale them up. We've got, uh, you know, Bangalore for certain is a great knowledge cluster, a cluster that has developed because of the various educational and research institutions, not by design, but things started happening because of these uh, institutions. And now today we are one of the biggest knowledge hubs in this country, and a research hub, and an innovation hub, and a startup hub. And it, the same thing is happening in other small clusters. Pune is one such example. You've got Hyderabad as an emerging cluster. And uh, you know, you've got a few of these. We must build on them. We should not be sort of strangling them and saying, okay, guys, now you've done very well, now let's, you know, help the other guys. That's, that's the wrong way of really focusing on wealth creation, is my view. Um, Aaron, coming to you, one of the reviews, um, which was very favorable of the, on, on the book, um, said that uh, it was a mistake, and it was one of the criticisms of the, of, of the book, um, that it's a mistake to confuse schooling with education. I, just because you have schooling doesn't necessarily mean you have good education. And that seems to me to be one of the problems here, that so much, so many schools don't operate well, so many children drop, drop out, that in fact just simply saying education is, is fantastic is not enough. You need to have real education that produces good results. Thank you. Um, you know, um, we started with um, Adam Smith and then we came all the way to this great economist Sujit Bhalla, and you mentioned others along the way. So it's about economics, yes, and looking at the issues around ourselves through the lens of economics. And uh, I'm reminded of my grandson, who's seven years old then, when he said what he said, which I'll tell you. He lives in the United States, and I had just joined the planning commission and been there a few months. And this young chap visited India and had been here then two years before that, when he was five, and had made some observations about the poverty in the country, which he saw on the streets of, of Delhi. And he was here two years later, and I was in the planning commission now, and we were driving through Delhi, and this guy exploded in the car. He said, what's the government doing? Counting daisies? He said, what do you mean counting daisies? Those were the days when the planning commission was putting out all this data about the poverty line and how many people have crossed the poverty line. But there was evidence that he could see, which was not good evidence. And I began to then think very hard about how we talk about people and the problems of people as numbers, how we try and convince them with numbers that the world is all right, and some of the numbers are to do with, well, the stock market is going up, so therefore your life should be all right, or, well, the GDP has gone up and foreign reserves have gone up and your life is all right. These are the numbers that we economists I'm not an economist, but economists discuss. What is it that we count? And Sujit, you said it well, that get the data and put the proof out. But you must count the right things. And like you said, education, yes, and Sujit has put it well, that many more children are in schools in India, have been in China and elsewhere. But does it mean, what you're saying, that they're educated? It's easy to measure the amount of time a child spends in school, but how to measure education and the capabilities that the child is acquiring. We are not doing that. So we sort of dismiss the problem and saying, well, they're getting educated, and therefore, inequality is reducing, which we can see evidence it is not reducing. And so I would ask us to question hmm, 
what is required to improve both the quantity as well as the quality of education in the country. And here last year, Arvind Subramaniam, same time of the year before the budget, was talking to the students at Jayapur University. And they all said at the end, Sir, we need more education. That is the wealth of the country and the quality of it. And his answer was this. He said, you know, the government will never put more money into education unless you people demand it, one. And of course, there'll have to be taxes then to pay for it. So what are you going to do and say? Number two, on the quality, he said, unless you send your children to the government schools and colleges, the quality of those schools and colleges will not improve. Let, let, let me ask a politically incorrect question. It's dangerous to educate people when they can't get jobs at the end of their education. Would it be better not to educate them? I, I'm glad she mentioned this. You see, we say education leads to wealth, and we've been talking in the previous session about if people buy more things and the businesses grow and the GDP grows and so on. But to get incomes to buy those things, they need the jobs and some opportunities to earn incomes. And India better keep both things going together. We have the situation where many more students coming out of well, private IITs and uh, engineering colleges, even the government ones, and management schools are finding at the end of it, we don't have a job. Now they spend so much of their life, taken loans, spend money, and they don't have a job. So rather than adding to the wealth, I think they're But is it better? Yeah. But would it be better wealth. to... Can I? Yeah. No, uh, you know, one of the... Um, one of the interesting results in the book um, is that, you know, I've, I've spent a lot of time, uh, and Arun Mara partly mentioned that, and measuring the poverty line and measuring how many people are below that line. Um, now, one of the interesting results in the book is that if you look at the poverty rates across the world from 1870 to now, it turns out there's almost a perfect correlation in the number of poor, that is the percentage poor, with the illiteracy rate in the country or in the world. So this is, and those of you, I encourage you to get the book, very simple. So the World Bank, myself, we wasted a lot of time uh, measuring uh, poverty when all we needed to do was to count the number of illiterates in the world. That's point number one I want to make. The second point is this whole thing about schooling and education. Very, very legitimate. <clears throat> you know, I was in the US in the 1980s, and the, the frame amongst the educators, in the media, amongst politicians, was Johnny goes to school, but Johnny cannot read. Now, fast forward to 2018, the Asa report. Sita goes to school, but Sita cannot read. So what we are going through is a very, very natural phase of education and expansion and schooling. In the first phase, what happens is you don't have enough teachers, but you can build the infrastructure for the school. So you build the infrastructure of the school, and you find that basically people or kids are going to school, but not getting educated. Now, that thing has changed in the US, and only very recently, as many of you know, if you, go to, uh, if you go to college in the US and you're in the STEM area, you can get fellowships, et cetera. So these are natural evolutions um, that need to be recognized that these are transient. You know, India is a developing country. A lot of developing countries have seen their fortunes, the poor have seen their fortunes improve manifold. Never before in the history of the world have so many poor people gotten so much better off in such a quick period of time as in the last 35 years. And I attribute that to education. Last point on the jobs. I will come to that later. But listen, let's look at the most, the biggest period of growth in India, 2004 to 2011-12. That was the period when jobs grew at 0.8% per annum. So I want to get to the point that it is the jobless growth is something that the world may be going through, but we certainly went through a long time before we can get to the point of jobs being created. And I think 
It's a matter of research. We have very little data on India. A lot of people are beginning to do it. It's the most important question about jobs, but I think there are incomplete answers at present. Kiran, did you? Yeah, I just want to say that, you know, Surjit, according to me, you talk about the poor and inequalities between the poor and the not so poor in terms of education. Today, to me, technology is the biggest leveler when it comes to poverty. And I personally believe that if you look at what's happening in the world, and especially in a country like India, where a seemingly uneducated person is actually able to use a mobile phone, use technology, it is a way of self-educating in a very different way. So when we set the education policy for this country, when we think about jobs for this country, I want to know why is it only being set by people who are like pre-IT and pre-the internet age? I think we must have people who understand digital technologies and the internet age. And to me, that is where we are flawed in terms of coming out with educational policies. Uh, you know, for instance, I believe that there is a huge amount of wealth creation just available to us in data science and data analytics and all that we talk about, whether it's artificial intelligence or machine learning, blah, blah, blah. But I think there's a lot of very valuable wealth to be unlocked through data science, okay? I mean, it's often said that data is the new fuel that basically drives the wealth and the research engines of any nation. That to me is also a big wealth creator. But what are we doing about it? You know, we've got all these, this very rich data that we are capturing. I mean, you know, you'll, many of the people in the audience will know that the combined market cap of the five leading data-led companies, which is Apple, Amazon, Microsoft, Facebook, and Google, is about $3.5 trillion, which is greater than the GDP of India. Which is, you know, so it tells you what this wealth creation opportunity is about. So if we can actually drive research and innovation in this disruptive way, and that's where I believe the education needs to be. <laughs> Sorry, can, can I interrupt? Well, just, Sorry. I just want to... The, you know, education needs to be revamped. Okay, we've got cartoons. Sorry to interrupt. We've got cartoons coming up on the screen, which Aaron Mara has brought. Could you quickly tell the audience what to um, look for in those cartoons when they, when our faces mercifully <laughs> go off the screen and they get the cartoons? Yes, you know, um, uh, Very quickly. 15 years ago, I was concerned myself with what we all concerned about making our whole country better for everybody, remaking India one country, one destiny. So I wrote it like an economist or a business person would write it, but to make it accessible, I thought a cartoonist, and who better than Lakshman, to provide cartoons to make the points. And he chose himself what he wanted me to use as his cartoon. So one, as you saw there, which was the one I made a point already, that just because certain indicators are going up, don't think the common man's life is, is improving. It's not improving. The next one, very nice one, we talked about phones and technology, to the next one, where uh, this is, again, 15 years ago, where Lakshman and we were all celebrating, you know, the deregulation of the telecommunications and people now have phones and cell phones, and this politician out in a village, and the, he's telling the people, what's wrong with you, anti-progress, I'm giving you phones, and you keep asking for drinking water. Okay. Uh, so there is... If you wish to have human development and human capacity, health, sanitation, jobs, and education, they must go together. It's not one thing. Okay, so looking at that system and how to improve it, we can talk about that. Okay, we need to move on because we're running out of time, and, I'm, and we're moving on now to the new elite. Um, you say elites have the survival ability of a cockroach, and that leads you rapidly into Fabian socialism. I always thought you got rid of cockroaches by stamping on them and their backs broke and that was it. <laughs> but when I said that earlier, Kieran said, oh, they multiply yeah. after, they've, after you stamped on them. Um, give us your, um, your view on that. And I, may I say that your stuff on page 11, where you talk about first it was the feudal elite that ruled the masses, then the industrial elite, and later the corporate elite. Um, it's yeah. all rather elitist, Look, actually. That paragraph about the elite going is actually a rather elitist sort of view. Yeah. It if we are running out of time, I'm sorry, John, I want to emphasize and communicate to the audience the central message of this book. It's not so much the elites, 
it's not so much cockroaches. It is how all our lives are being transformed and will fantastically be transformed because of what education has done to the emancipation of women. This is going to be the biggest contribution of education to the world. Interpersonal relationships are going to change as women get empowered. That is the power of education. Think about any counterfactual you want to. Would women have been, you know, just yesterday, um, there was an article about Oxford, a thousand-year institute, an education institute. And for the first time in its thousand-year history, there are more girls than boys entering Oxford University. Just think. Think about how the world was different 30 years ago. You can think India, you can think China, you can think Zimbabwe, anywhere. This is the major story of our times. You, a lot of youngsters over here, you don't know what it was like just 20 years ago. And we don't know what it's going to be like 20 years from now, but one thing I'll guarantee you is that the empowerment of women is the biggest story of the 21st century. Yeah, yeah. And that has been made possible only and exclusively by education. That's, we can talk about this schooling versus education, jobs versus not jobs. They are, in the broad sweep of history, minor details. The biggest detail is there is equality now between the sexes and, as I point out in the book also, in the world. But, so we have Oxfam talking about how 1%, there was a previous session, 1% in the world own 82% of the wealth. What I point out in this book is that that logic is very flawed because education is wealth. So if we now take the total education in the world, embodied and measured correctly, the total wealth of education today is $320 trillion and about 25, 30% more than the financial wealth. Last point, financial wealth has come about because in large part of education. Um, Aaron, that, that seems to me, with all respect to Sergi, a rather elitist view at a time when we're supposed to be getting rid and having new elites. What's your view? I mean, you know, uh, half uh, the population in this country are, 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 are poverty stricken. Whenever I've heard this discussed, whenever I've heard this, whenever I've heard, whenever I've heard this discussed by you on other sessions, we always get round to boardrooms before we've even considered anything else. Not many, there aren't many women or not that many boards or an awful lot of people in poverty. Aaron, what do you think? Well, you know, uh, again, we must use numbers to uh, say, well, there's something to consider here. Um, uh, it is true that over a long sweep of uh, history, recent history, people in the world have become, on average, less poor, on average, less poor. But it's also true that in the last 20 years, the rich have become much, much richer. So the rate at which, and India is the country which has got, by the way, according to economists' calculations themselves, the biggest gap between the pace at which the rich are getting richer and the poor are getting less poor. So there is an increase in what you would call wealth inequality, and that, of course, arises from opportunity so inequality. Stay with the women point for the moment. Okay, stay I'm with the women, point, the women for the point. point. And so, point again, we wake up and say education is very important, and thank you, you know, to remind us that education is very important. But have we solved the problem? No. Yes, we've woken up to the fact that women need to be equal. Are they equal? No. So let's carry on and say what's the agenda and how will we do it? Kiran, when I was preparing for this session, everybody said, well, you've got Kiran on the platform. She'll talk about women. That is a rather chauvinistic um, approach, but nevertheless, you're here, so please. Well, I think, you know, there's nobody can argue with the fact that, you know, if you want to have equitable and inclusive growth, you can't do it without women. And I think at last, I think the world is recognizing what women bring to the economy and economic development. Um, 
whilst you have a lot of statistics to say that there are more women getting into the portals of Oxford, you've got more women enrolling into the schools and colleges, and certainly this government has to be commended on its very singular focus on educating the girl child. The fact remains that there is inequality, and I think that's where we need to focus. Again, it's about are we educating the women so that they play a bigger role in the, in the society. society, the economy, and everything in else. In the families and everything. And I think that's where the problem is. So even when I look at my own company, I know that there are certain jobs that, you know, we don't look at women doing those roles. But there are many jobs where we find a lot of women scientists coming and doing some great stuff. So how do we basically get more women into the mainstream? I mean, you yourself said, look at the pathetic uh, profile of our boardrooms in India. I think it's really, really pathetic. But we're back to boardrooms again. Yeah, but I'm just saying it starts with that mindset. You see, let's, let's face it. We talk about society, we talk about uh, the elite, we talk about the poor. Have we changed our mindset in this country, whether it's at the lowest strata or whether it's at the highest strata? I think we view women very differently. They are not equal citizens, I'm sorry. And how much, how much in picking up, Serge, picking up Serge's main point, how much do you think education has improved the lot of the mass of women in the country, not the elite? Well, there's no doubt about it that education empowers women. Absolutely no doubt about it. It is successful in pockets. In Tamil Nadu and... Uh, yes, I think we are seeing a lot of success in educating our women in many parts of the country. And a lot has to do with societal mindsets. So in the South, I think women are far more empowered than in the North. It's a fact. And mm -hmm. that's to do with education. Because are we educa educating our women... Uh, in, in the right way. Are the, is the girl child receiving the right education? Is she being allowed to, you know, complete her education? That's another problem. Um, Sergi, do you think maybe we should retitle the book The Elite Wealth of Nations? The Elite, sorry? The Elite Wealth of Nations. I, I didn't, I, elite Wealth of Nations. Elite. elite. No, I think it's completely wrong, John. And you know that's completely wrong. Um, <laughs> well, it's you know, where, where do I begin? I mean, look, you know, as I said, just think back 20 years and think ahead 20 years and you can draw. One statistic I want to bring about, which Kiran might find and you might find um, interesting, is that it's often alleged, correctly, that there are very few women on boards, corporate boards, in companies around the world, not just in India. So there is a section in the book which looks at several different countries and how many women are on the boards of corporates. The number one country, the least discriminatory country in that list is India. The second least discriminatory country in that list is France. But India is number one. Now how do I get this radical result? Just to give you an idea as to how data can be used and misused, it turns out that in India, 12% of people on corporate boards are women. In the US, it's 17%. But Sergeant, I'm trying to so bring you away from being, corporate boards and talk about being, life. Sorry? I'm trying to get you away from the boardrooms to talk about what's happening actually on the ground, what's happening to women in this country. We've done the boardrooms, surely. I, I look, I, you know, I have studied this problem. I have, uh, many of us have studied this problem. You just look at the progress. I mean, look, let me just give you one other statistic, okay? It's, it's, you know, between 1980 and 2016, India and China have 40% of the world's population whose average per capita income has grown at 6.5% per annum. That is doubling every 12 years, and you can do your math. It's gone up eight times. Now, maybe China has 60% of it, we have 40%. But listen, the country is transformed. There's a lot more transforming to do, but you know, this whole idea, the poverty debate, you know, in the name of the poor, we need to get away from these concepts in India in order to solve the real problems. Now, don't get me started. Part of our problems in education, 
is reservations. Part of our problem in life in Indian economy is reservations, the quota system. You just heard two days ago, right beside the Sai, on cricket, as to why cricket is flourishing in India, and we won the test match yesterday, is because it doesn't have a quota system. So those are the real problems about inequality, is the quota system. You want to worry about education, worry about quotas. And we don't have to have a quota system if we can actually give the right to education and right for everyone to be educated. Right. <laughs> would you like to pick up now on the general point on the elite? Um, um, uh, would you like to pick up on the general point that you make on the elite, not just on women? You're saying there's a new elite. You're saying, you're saying, you're saying there is a new elite, yeah. not just women. Yeah. Can you just develop your argument? Very briefly on, the, on that, look, and then I want to move on to India and discuss yeah. whether there is a new elite in India. You know, I, I think apart from the, the second most important development um, in India and around the world, but India is at the forefront. First I mentioned was the, equal, the m rapid move towards equalization of incomes, opportunities, education between boys and girls, between men and women. The second I think very interesting development that, has take, that education has allowed is for a rise of a new elite, a very merit-oriented elite, because it stems from education, not your connections and not your feudal wealth, but from education. So Bangalore is an example of a lot of wealth created. This is not inherited wealth. This is not dynastic wealth. This is the wealth created by ability and education. Technology, you mentioned very correctly, research and development. Look, before we can run, we should learn to walk. Before we can use technology, research and development, you've got to be educated. Otherwise, unless you're a genius, I don't know how many geniuses, technology geniuses didn't have education, but that's a separate point. So I think, look, we are, you know, we should be celebrating this age where such large developments are taking place, meritocratic developments, equalization. As you know, one statistic, you can throw it aside, but world inequality, world, not the US inequality, you know, there's a, too much of a tendency amongst journalists in India, amongst academics in India, amongst everywhere, to look at what's happening in the US and that's happening in the world. world US inequality is at the highest level ever, highest level. And world inequality is today down to the levels last observed in 1870. That's a revolution. The example you chose, um, the example you chose in India, of course, Bangalore, um, Kiran, is not just education. It's education plus technology. Because if there hadn't been the technology, yeah, there, but why you should yeah, why should they be the mutually other, exclusive? The, hmm? Why should they be mutually exclusive? I mean, it's not technology and education. Technology is embedded in education. Mm. And I think what you have, what he's, what uh, Surjit said was absolutely true, that the education has basically, and the knowledge-led education in Bangalore has equalized the population. And I think you're right. If you call the knowledge workers as the elite, I think that's a very good way to progress. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Right. More, 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 more so than the political elite. Yeah. Um, I've got one or two questions. Aaron, um, one of the points that um, Sergit makes is that um, the new um, elite uh, in Delhi, i.e. the Modi government, is doing things that previous governments would not have done. Um, one thing they say is, he says, is that the old elite were too elitist to reform agriculture. By that, of course, he means the last government, and you were on the planning commission, so he means you. <laughs> <laughs> did, I mean, serious question at the end of that, having got the laughter, is um, did the last government dodge doing agriculture? Did the planning commission want it to happen? And no, I, I, you know, we collectively, uh, set priorities, and I'm using the word collectively, it's not just the officers of government. There is a pressure from the system to this must be our priority. So, yes, we had a big agriculture division in the planning commission and big programs and ministries and in the states, but was that our priority on which we were focusing? We were 
experiencing at the end of our, our term, and which is, was being experienced at the start of this new government's term, farmers committing suicides because they can't pay the loans that they have taken for modern technology, meaning seeds and, and pesticides and, and fertilizers. Well, the prices in the market wasn't working for them. And then, when some people suggested that, look, they're dying and their families will suffer, why can't we forgive their loans? Oh, that's a socialist idea. It will destroy the market. And when, in the US previously, and now in our country, big companies are defaulting on their loans, we say, let's find means to preserving them, excusing them, giving them time, because that's capitalism, and that is good. That is good. So we talk of our views. I don't want to necessarily say elite or otherwise. There is a thread, as I said, of an economic paradigm here, that the small can be ignored. There's something wrong with them. They're informal. They're not willing to adopt new practices, but they can't afford it sometimes, right? So that's their problem. We are all right. If they just became like us, everything would be all right. But how are they going to become like us? There's an escalator. And the bottom steps of the escalator in India are missing. And we've got the upper steps if you keep improving with better technology for ourselves, but they can't scamper up. We've got to reach down and build those bottom steps of the escalator in terms of education, in terms of jobs, which are informal sector jobs and small enterprises, and thus enable incomes to grow along with capabilities of people to, to earn, to grow. And we are missing that agenda. And I say that, I would say to the credit of the present government as we're going forward, that you know the country is recognizing that this is what we have to do. In our time, in my time, we said jobs is the number one priority. And Sujit was there. And I was told, I'm not an economist of that sort, that Jobs? Are you becoming socialist? I said, no, it's the, what makes the economy grow and people's lives and incomes grow. You have to make the objective of growth, the creation of jobs and abilities of people, and jobs defined in, in various ways, and people's abilities to earn through those various types of jobs. That must be the objective of growth, not the size of growth. And are we doing it? I think now, because of the alarms about uh, youth coming out here in Rajasthan for other reasons. But there are people who are disenchanted with, or in Gujarat, the Patidar, disenchanted with the pattern of growth. It's not the size of the economy. It's the pattern of the growth, and I would say the pattern of our society. Yeah. So, so one, picking up on that, what, what, what do you think, yeah, what we might know, one, call them? You know, you'd mentioned about the old and new elite and the pursuit of agriculture, the non-pursuit. It's in the, it's you in know, the book. One of the... Uh, if you do a comparative study, and many people in the audience must have done it, many economists have done it, you know, one of the biggest failures of Indian economy, starting from 1950, and this, I think, was a reflection of the attitude of the old elite, is that we emphasized higher education, college education, temples of the elite, rather than expand primary and secondary education. So if you look at developing countries from Tanzania to China to Brazil, basically they expanded the primary and secondary education first and then came to uh, college education. So this is, you know, the old elite, the, the other distinction that I draw, um, and you may or may not agree with it, I suspect many of you won't, but one distinction about the old elite is that it thinks that it knows better. That the common masses, what Adam Smith talked about, the impersonal uh, doings of the market will inevitably lead to disaster. Therefore, you need a guardian angel in the form of the old elite in order to guide the fortunes and misfortunes of the large masses we talk about. What, the, what education has done and will do is basically allow, take this power away from the old elite and allow a more meritocratic and more equal member in a world where you have unequal education, that creates the inequality that we should be really worried about. If you have, if everybody's educated, then your inequality will reflect ability. I don't know whether that'll be good or bad, 
but it'll be a lot fairer than the present system where those who have access to education determine the fortunes of their children. And that is highly unequal. Um, Kieran, um, on, on the general elite point and the results of the last election, which certainly in Delhi, and it's a rather Delhi view, has brought in this new elite who are running the government, and it's, you might call it the Modi elite. Um, do you think in the states, that in, in the different states around India, that you feel that there's a new elite in charge? Has the government in Bangalore changed, or has the government in Tamil Nadu changed? Well, first and foremost, I I'm think asking for a non-Delhi view, since the three of us yeah. all come from no, Delhi. No, I think, I think state governments are recognizing the importance of education and coming out with new education policies for sure. I certainly believe that many states are really focused on um, making sure that, you know, there is inclusive education for both men and women. Um, what is interesting is that actually a new education policy is being developed as we speak. Um, I was talking to one of the young people and I was glad to see that young people are being involved in coming up with a new education policy, but the young person also mentioned to me that they've also created the usual committee of many, many people who shouldn't be there. So I, I worry about what are we going to finally come out with. So right. I really think we need a very, very different and refreshed view about how we come up and evolve such important policies like the education policy. And that's where I believe a lot of young, successful young minds, people in fact who have actually benefited from education, uh, should actually be involved in coming out with our new education policy. Lovely. Let's open this up now. Questions, please. Uh, the one down on the front here is, is the nearest. Oh, all right, that's the next nearest. Well, the two of them. You first and then you. Thank you. Uh, my name is Jitesh Madhwani, and uh, my question is... Uh, if, if you could say who you're... If you could, if, when you ask the questions, please, no speeches, quick questions, and if you want to direct it at one of the panel, then please do. Uh, no, the question is open to the panel. Uh, uh, we've talked about uh, education, research and development, data, etc. Uh, would anyone or all of you like to articulate the importance of basic things like uh, civic sense, common courtesies, and soft skills, and the role they play in creating opportunities and wealth. And let's take one more. We've got another one here. Uh, and question, then we'll go further back. My question is to you, ma'am. We talk a lot about education and how it's important for women uh, to enter the public sphere, right? Except once you're in that public sphere, there are a lot of factors that stop you in terms of like the glass ceiling, etc. So don't you think that a kind of mental revolution in terms of societal uh, change is something that a country like India needs to focus on more uh, to get women to that platform? Yeah, I think both your questions are sort of intertwined. Because I really think when you talk about behavioral traits of society, civic sense, it's all about the right kind of education. So I think really our education has to be, you know, very differently looked at because it has to achieve both of what you talked about. How do you develop a sense of civic responsibility? How do you uh, develop a sense of, uh, uh, you know, behavioral, uh, societal behavior that actually doesn't do what is happening today? Okay, we've got two more questions where you're standing. The lady... And, and then the guy in front of the glasses who's energetically waving his hand. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Akanksha. My question is to Surjit, sir. Sir, here we were discussing about educating women, women, but in our country, uh, we'll be able to educate women until we save a girl child, right? So don't we need to focus on basic amenities, right, like food? Because while we sit here and talk about educating people, there are people who don't know how to get the daily bread for dinner. So, uh, discussing about education and also focusing about basic amenities, because until we surpass those things, educating will not benefit. Question, so question you. is, would you, uh, what is your take on that, Sujit, sir? Or any suggestions? Okay. And the guy sitting down in front of you, yes. Yeah, uh, fortunately or unfortunately, my question intersects with hers. Uh, and it's specifically to Surjit and uh, Kiran. Uh, this morning, the Prime Minister he had one of his monkey bath uh, things where a third of it at least was about uh, women's empowerment. 
बट माय क्वेश्चन इज शुड इट रादर बी बेटी पढ़ाओ और गरीब पढ़ाओ व्हाट विल वर्क बेटर Uh, so one, one here, one here. Sir, my question is to you, Mr. Bala. Uh, you spoke on how reservation is something that we need to do away with. So, say in vill like villages in India, there are Dalit childs who are not allowed to enter schools. Their access point to that education is flawed, and they don't get it right. In such a paradigm, and when you talk about how education is the new wealth, and they're being denied access to that education. Why is it that you would want to do away with reservations? Okay, um, Kiran, and then yeah. um, you go ahead. Kiran, do you want to go? No, ahead? I just wanted to say there should not be reservation because if you have the right to education as a policy, then irrespective of you who you are, you should be able to uh, enter the uh, school. Today we don't have that opportunity, and that's why you have reservation. Do we yeah. have enough college seats? Do we have enough schools? Do we yeah. have, you know, enough uh, places to educate? Okay, let me let me address um, your question as follows: um, That look, what is the alternative to reservations for Dalits, for those, and you know, Dalits, and let's say the bottom half of the population, bottom 50 percent. There might be Dalits, there might be Muslims, there might be Hindus, whoever it is that who is poor. Now. Our education system, and this I'm appealing to all of you, is geared to the, the rich, the middle class, the elite, sends their kids to private high schools. And you pay something like 50 or 60,000 rupees and more in order to educate your child. Now, my simple proposal is that the government, all the government colleges, require you to pay the same fees in college as you did in high school. Okay, so if a poor person went to high school and paid only 50 rupees, he or she pays only 50 rupees when he or she enters college. What does the government do with all this money? It finances the education, primary, secondary, and college education of the poor, the Dalits, etc. You get scholarships, the Dalits get scholarships, the poor get scholarships, full paid scholarships, which comes out of the pockets of the elite. That's how we need to change. So I, I'm not saying do away with reservation. You need to bring about equality of opportunity, and that we have confused for 70 years, equality of opportunity with reservations. That needs to change. Uh, the next question here, uh, then. Could, could we take a mic over to those poor people sitting sir? in the sun over there, who I think deserve to... Okay, one here, one here, uh, and then sir, take the my microphone over there to the people sitting in the sun. You first. Yeah. Okay, you first. sir, my question is to the honorable panelists, that what is at necessary at first? It's like a, a well-formed mind who is quick to react, or a well-educated mind. As example, you gave that, uh, the villager. In the villager, he is able to go through the new smartphone, but he's illiterate. And on the other hand, the new IITNs who are dropping out of the, at the first year and the second year and they are not satisfied with their job. So what is necessary? A well-educated mind or a well-formed mind who is quick to react at this new world? And one here. Uh, hello, madam. I have a question for you. Uh, we were talking about education, but what kind of education uh, we refer to? Are we talking about the education which is value-based? Are we talking about the education which is vocational or are we talking about the education which is colored by any political ideology? Do, do you want to come I'd in like on that? to just take that because we talked about the jobs and education and looking at it as a system which several of us, technology people, education people, industrial people did together and we found that looking around the world also that the technologies are changing industries and jobs even in administration. What we need is people who be are lifelong learners, because you can't be taught something's going to remain useful for you for a long time. So the whole education approach must shift away from two things. One is the quantity of inputs, which is how many years you spend in a classroom, which is a very poor indicator about 
what useful education that you got. The second is even passing the exams at the end of those schools, which is what you measure in the PISA, how many people could read maths and stuff. That is also not good enough. Going back to the soft skills like you talked about, how do you get in children and people the desire to continue to learn, to continue to learn, and for the education system to provide in a modular, small fashion, number of opportunities to continue to acquire the skills that they would need as they find a job or some opportunity to apply that skill, Kira? to change the paradigm of education altogether. Kira. And just to add to that, I just wanted to mention that you, you asked three very important questions. I think education is about the ability to apply knowledge. Okay, How do, how do you think about what you've learned? So it's about the learning process. It's about enabling people to develop a logical mindset, a questioning mindset, and an ability to apply that knowledge that you have learned. It is agnostic to everything else, okay? So I just wanted you to know that education has to be agnostic to any doctrine or any kind of other influence. It's purely about teaching you how to learn. I don't think we answered the question from down there, but I didn't hear it. it, didn't, it didn't. Oh, yeah. Um, I think he just said that, you know, what is, uh, uh, you know, what, what do you mean by education? Do, do you mean to say that the farmer uh, is also delivering something and is, is the elite delivering? I think you must understand that anybody who delivers something which is added value shows education. I mean, education has to deliver added value. Okay, two questions. Even if it's a farmer. Two questions in the sun, you and the guy behind you. Okay, th thank you very much. I just wanted to... Uh, Try and phrase this question such Briefly, that please. you see in not only this nation, but many other nations, a, an increased concentration of wealth into the hands of fewer and fewer people. And it's the distribution of that wealth, which I think you are trying to get at by education, because with that, you open up the potential for innovation as you raise the level of everyone else who's not currently in the top few percent. How, how can you actually move towards a state that that occurs. Uh, let's take that question, um, because it brings us on to the Oxfam thing, which we haven't had time to deal with. Well, that the, like, the world is getting less, I, less, I, I'm, less I'm, equal. I'm sorry to plug my book, but exactly that question is answered and proven that your assumptions are in error. But I'm sorry to say that I think by your premise, so just by the book, it's all explained in there, quite honestly. And it's a very good question. It's something I tussle with. But One more question, the last question. My question is from Kiran Ma'am. Kiran Ma'am, you said uh, in Biocon, also in your company, there are few positions for which you don't look for women. But you have the opportunity, you are the chairperson of IM Bangalore. What have you done there to remove this inequality? What are you planning to do there? Yeah, for instance, there are policies that don't allow us to hire women to work in shifts. So the IT sector has basically got a policy to allow that. But unfortunately, other sectors have not been able to get those kind of policy measures. So I'm just saying a lot of it is tied to policies which must change with the times. OK, I've been told we have to close. So the guy over there with the microphone can no, bring no, the microphone. No, 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 I'm sorry. I have a book launch at 1.40. Yeah, okay, so I've been to finish. Be um, thank you very much indeed, everybody. answer your questions. I know you have a lot of questions. But I have to end. I don't have any time. I just have 40 minutes for book okay, session. So bring the microphone so over thank and ask you, the question. Thank you, Surjit. Thank you, Kiran. Thank you, Aran. And sorry, John. But thank you very much for being here. Our next session, just in seven minutes, we have to turn up for a book launch. So thank you so much for being here.